Father, we thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity, O oh Lord, Father, that you have given to each one of us to be found in your house this morning, to be able to praise you, to be able to listen to your word, to be able to listen to exhortation. Lord, Father, a privilege that is not afforded in so many areas around the world, even in our own country. But Lord, you gave us this freedom. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We praise you, Lord, even as we listen to your voice, to your word. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. But Father, mold us, change us, transform us from glory to glory. Put the fear of God in our hearts that we will not sin against you. We need that, O Lord. Otherwise, O Lord, this entire exercise will be futile. I pray, O Lord, that you would touch us, draw us close to you, enable us, Lord Father, to be just not hearers of the word, but to be doers. I commit myself to your hands. I pray, O Lord, that you would speak through me, speak to me first, and speak to each one of us. Praise you, I worship you, in Jesus' name. Amen. The mouth of two witnesses. Everything gets established. I just wanted him to ask. Uh, I wanted to ask Pastor to stop because he was just taking my word. <laughs> Amazing. This text for today is found in Jeremiah chapter 18, and this also happens to be the theme for our VBS, which is coming. Uh, uh, next weekend, next week onwards, and uh, we've also been studying in our Jeremiah Bible study, and I'm telling you honestly, it's totally different. God is good. Let's read from verse 1 onwards. Just want us to be very sensitive to the Spirit, voice of the Spirit. Just, just like, just wanted to point out certain things that what Pastor said. You know, one of the things that I really observe in today's young generation is our inability to wrestle with words. We don't wrestle. We don't question. You know, we just take a message, tweak it here a bit, tweak it here a bit, tweak it here, tweak it there, add a few verses here and there and make another one. There's no originality. You know, there's a term called plagiarism, right? Or we say in our church, we don't plagiarize. But I tell you, if you have not got the word from God on your knees, it's plagiarized. It's copied. Something which I believe each one of us has to be dedicated to that practice of wrestling with words. And I get some, I, you know, sometimes I get some feelers from my young people. You know, saying, Jesus, the word went above my head. Spiritual people. Why did it go above your head? Because there's no substance to grasp that word. You know, we don't want anything, e everything is easy these days, right? We don't want to wrestle with something which is so important. Important to wrestle with the scriptures. And so a lot of people have this uh, negative opinion about theologians. It's, there are some theologians who are godly people who wrestle with the scripture. They just take one verse from the Bible and they just tear it apart, not to kill the message in it, but to really go deeper into the understanding as to what God is communicating to that one word. Wrestling, it's very important. Something which we have not accustomed our mind to. We want, you know, solution manuals. What we call as guides. A little posh language solution manual. There's no originality, you know. It's very important, right? To have something original. And then you get your PhD, otherwise you will not. I'm not talking about worldly PhD, I'm just talking about something. Even in, 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 we just have this casual approach to God. 
This doesn't matter. But I'm telling you, if you read the scripture, I wonder how many PhDs have been given to, to kill people in the faith. But there's so many things in the word and so many theologians don't have it. That's exactly the reason why, you know what, when Jesus, God, Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus says, you need to be born again, he's shocked. And he says, are you a teacher? Oh, you're a Pharisee and you don't know these things? And maybe he got everything from his, from his spiritual head and he just grasped it without questioning. Okay, very important, wrestling with scripture, it's very important. And I absolutely second, I'm not saying that I do it myself, but I really want that. That attitude to wrestle, wrestle with God, wrestle with scripture. You know, something which is, that is a radical thinking, by the way. To wrestle with scripture is radical. Not getting satisfied with second best. That requires death to a lot of our own pursuits. Uh, we are satisfied with a deeper consecration, right? By the end of the message, I came closer to God. That is second best. How about a radical change? That is the best. After all, second best is not that bad, right? Think about it. So many of us are actually satisfied with second best. And that's the premise with uh, which I want to start this message. Let's read on from verse 1 onwards. The word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah from the Lord. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Very important. Saying, arise, go down to the potter's house and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house and there he was. Making something at the vessel, at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Says the Lord, look, as the clay is in the, ha- in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The ins- Okay, let's stop here for a minute. Before we go to the next passage. He's talking about God is the potter and we are the clay. Question is, we've heard it so many times. It sounds so much like a cliche now. Oh, he sang it so many times. You are the potter, we are the clay. But what it really means to be in the hands of a potter. So when you want to examine what God is trying to say, you don't read scripture out of context. You also examine what he's trying to say later. You know, it's just not a juxtaposition of random verses or random prophecies. Everything in the kingdom of God, there is an order and sometimes... When he says something and immediately goes to the other, it's, apparently it seems that there is no connection between the two. Okay, before I want, so let, let us let us look at the sequence of words, verses once again. Uh, just turn to verse four. Verse four, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the potter's hand, so he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. All right. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? Says the Lord. Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Does he stop there? Next verse. The instant I speak concerning a nation, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about nations anymore, I'm just talking about individuals, okay? And concerning a kingdom, to pluck up to pull down, to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will retent, relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. What is the connection? 
Did you ever think about it? You are the potter. I am the clay. The next verse is, at an instant where I think about bringing disaster into an evil generation, if that evil generation repents of its sin, I will not bring the disaster upon it. So what is the connection? Did you ever think about it? What is the connection between you are the potter, I am the clay, and the next verse says, if you turn from your evil ways, I will not bring disaster upon you. Next. Next verse. Verse 9. And the instant I speak concerning a nation or an individual, let's look at individual or a kingdom, to build it, to plant it. So why does God build a nation or plant a nation? He says something righteous or good in him or her. Okay? If it does evil in my sight, so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. Now, think about for a moment, what is the connection between you are the potter, I am the clay. And what instant God says, at some instant there is a wicked and a perverse generation, I go and say, I will bring evil upon your life if you don't turn from, turn from your wicked ways. And that wicked person, you know, forsakes his sin and comes back to the Lord. The Lord says, I will repent of the evil that I thought I will do unto him. Second verse says, if there is a people or a person whom I thought I will establish, if that man or woman stops doing right and does evil, I will stop doing good to that person. So now you should understand, try to, you know, what, what is the whole purpose of this? Let's compare scripture with scripture. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 24 to 32. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 24 to 32. Verse 23, do I have any pleasure at all in the wicked that they should die? That's what God says, right? In Jeremiah, if a wicked person repents of his sin, I will repent of the evil that I thought I will do unto him, right? Says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live. Look at verse 24. But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and thus according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered, because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty, and the sin which he has committed, because of them he shall die. It's amazing. That is the whole antithesis of Christianity with the other religions. According to the other religions, you do a lot of good in the final, and you have also done some evil works. If your good works outweigh your evil works, then you're okay. But God says, if you're a righteous man, you are a righteous man, and one day you did iniquity. All your righteousness that you did till that time will not be remembered. Totally opposite. We still didn't get it. Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 11 to 13. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But the wicked turn from his evil way and live. Turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? Therefore you, O son of man, say to the children of your people, the righteousness of the righteous man shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. Can you just turn to KJV please? Here. It's a very interesting thing that God says here. Very important. I just want us to look at that very carefully. Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 11. 12 now, 12. Yeah. Therefore thou son of man say unto the children of thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. 
As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. And neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. When I shall surely say to the righteous that he shall surely live. If he trust in his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered. I know, look at this. This is incredible. What is he saying? The righteous, he has done so much of righteousness, but one day, because of his self-righteousness, what did he do? He committed what? He didn't say he committed sin. Did he say he committed sin? No, no, no. He said, you committed iniquity. What, is it? what does it mean by that? You should understand something like this, no? Yesterday, pastor was talking about overcoming. Pastors, you want to overcome temptation in your life, don't give room for your temptation. So two weeks you overcame the habit of drinking, let's say. But you said, for emergency purpose, I will put a small bottle inside. Just in case. You know what that actually means? You know what? I worked for you so long, so much. I was righteous all these days. Can you just not give me some provision for my sin? Once, one trip. What has happened? Your righteousness now has become a legal cover for your sin. You thought, oh God, I worked so hard for your kingdom. See, every Sunday I was here before 8.30. I came to every Bible study. I came to every fasting and prayer. I worked so hard in the kingdom. I overcame sin so much. But Lord, can you just not give me a little provision? You know, what God, you know what God's saying? Your righteousness has become iniquity. Your self-righteousness has given you a legal cover for your sin. And you know what? Where he's mentioning this? In what context is he mentioning? I am the potter. You are the clay. Think about it. I don't know what, please, I, I just want, to, want, us, want us to be very attentive to this particular message. Because as much as there is exhortation and encouragement, there is also reproof and correction. End of this is not very, very, very cute. You should, that's exactly what happened even with Moses. What was he? He was a righteous man. And one day God said, speak to the rock. You know what did, what did he do? What did he do? He went and smote the rock. What happened? All the righteous deeds that he committed so long have given him a legal cover to disobey. Think about it. Think about that. Is it possible? And you know what he says? That's, what, that's the reason why he says, if a wicked man turns from his wickedness, I will repent. But if a righteous man, that is more important for us. If a righteous man turns from his righteousness and he does not commit sin, he commits what? Iniquity. Iniquity. And God sees it much more seriously than he sees a wicked man. So what is the reason behind all this? Ephesians chapter 5 verse 15 to 21. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 21. See then, that he walk, what? Circumspectly, not as fools, but as a wise. So even as your walk is getting narrower and narrower and narrower, you need to become more and more and more circumspect in your walk with God. There's no provision. What you could have done four years earlier, you cannot do it today. God says that is iniquity. You cannot do it. What was allowed four years ago is not allowed to you today. Next. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. 
Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto the Lord and uh, unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another. The key is. Do you, are you, are we growing in the fear of God? The question is that. Absolutely the question there. Why is that, what is the reason that the righteous man is committing iniquity? You know why? For once, somehow the fear of God has departed him. See, when Jesus comes, I want to show you this verse in Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. <coughs> Everybody knows this. Verse 2 onwards. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and mind, the spirit of the knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. What is what is he saying? The One of the fruits or the gifts or the fruits of the Holy Spirit is that you will grow in the fear of the Lord. Right? Do you agree? Okay. But unlike every other gift... There's a distinction between the fear of God and every other spiritual gift. What is that distinction? What is the distinction? Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, <coughs> verses 27 onwards. Okay, verse 24 onwards. Verse 24 onwards. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But he, have, but he have set it not all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress, distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they will, they will not find me. For they hated knowledge. And did not what? Choose. Ah. Oh. Every other gift, there's a distinction between the fear of God and every other spiritual gift. You have to choose. You know, this is an abstraction. How do I choose the fear of God? How do I choose? What do I need to do in order for me to choose the fear of God? The answer is found in the first few verses of Proverbs chapter 2. <coughs> Look at this. My son... If you will receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear to wisdom, and apply your heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding. If thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as hid treasures. These are all doing. Then was, then you will understand what? The fear of God. You know what? You know what it means actually to each one of us? How do I choose the fear of God? How do I choose the fear of God? If there is a meeting, I am there. Not because I want to gain knowledge, but I want to hear the word so that it will pierce my heart and I will choose what is right in God's sight. Every meeting I am there, every Bible study I am there, not because I want to gain understanding in the word of God, but I want to grow in the fear of God. The question is, how many of us have chosen the fear of God? It's a choice. It's ultimately the tyranny of free will. No, it, it ultimately boils down to what choices we make on a daily basis. Surrender daily. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice daily. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind daily. It's not one day. It was day after day after day you choose the fear of God. The question is, are we growing in the fear of God? Are we becoming complacent? You know, one, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm telling, I'm actually speaking to myself. Some sins that I overcame several years back, it seems to come back to me. And I'm not able to overcome and saying, wait, God, what is the reason? He says, you know what, you're becoming complacent. You're thinking that because you grew so much in your kingdom, you have a provision for little sin. No, no. Your righteousness has become iniquity. Did you ever think in the context of 
I am the potter and you are the clay that this is what God is requiring from each one of us. When God says, I am the potter and you are the clay. And you know to whom he's saying, you should understand the, the context in which God is saying this to the kingdom of Israel. He's saying, especially Judah, he's saying, you know what, guys, destruction is coming. You will get into captivity. Captivity is set for all of you. What, you know, what, let me just look at this verse very carefully. Just go back to verse 6 of chapter 18 of Jeremiah. <clears throat> Slowly, let us read it carefully. Chapter 18, verse 6. Verse 4, verse 4 it says, <clears throat> And the vessel that he made was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, has seemed good to the potter to make it. Okay, next verse. Then, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? You know what he's actually talking about? He's saying, I want you to grow in my kingdom. But the way I'm taking you to success is not the way you think success is. I'm going to take you through captivity so that I will bring character in you. That is what he's saying. He's saying, Jeremiah is saying to the house of Israel, to the house of Judah, as the potter, I mean, as the clay is in the potter's hand, you are in my hand. So as the potter seemed good, he made the, he made the pot, right? Cannot I do it the same way with you? The question is, do we allow God to use us, to mold us in the way he would want us to be molded? What if you have to go through failure in life? You will go through failure. What if you will go through misunderstanding in your life? You will go through misunderstanding. What if so many things happen to you, but God says, that is my process, the way I am molding you in my image. Can I not do the same way? Can I cannot just do the same way the potter is doing with you? So in other words, do we accept the sovereignty of God in our lives? Let me ask you, let, let us look at a particular verse in Luke chapter 22, verse 31. Now this is Simon Peter. He says, Simon Peter says, Lord, even though if everybody forsakes me, I will still follow you. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desire to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. You know, in other words, translations he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked me for permission to sift you. Okay, no, next verse, next verse. 31. 31, next verse. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen my brethren. You know what he's saying? Simon, I have set failure for you. It is in my plan that you will fail. You made all these boasts, right? That even though everybody forsakes me, you will not forsake. You know what? When you became self-righteous and very proud, Satan looked at it and said, God, 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 he's becoming proud. Can you just give me permission? Permission once, once. Once permission. He said, okay, fine. Take it. Before the cock crows thrice, I mean, you will deny me thrice before the cock crows. Can you imagine? You should see, it's very interesting how Simon Peter is 
what do you call signed up into discipleship. Very interesting. Out of all the other disciples, the way Simon Peter becomes a disciple of Jesus is unique. It's absolutely unique. And it's not recorded in one gospel. It is recorded in several places. I want us to look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 19. First, first time Simon Peter appears in the Bible. First time Simon Peter's Matthew chapter 4 verses 18 to 19. Okay. And Jesus was walking by the sea of Galilee. Saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Next verse. Going on, from, so sorry, what happened to verse 20? It's not there. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, 18 and 20. Sorry, I'll just read it. Verse 20 it says, and they straight away left their nets and followed him. Verse 20. They straight away left their nets and followed him. But between verse 19 and verse 20, something very interesting happens. What does verse 18 say? Jesus saw Simon Peter and his brother casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And Jesus said, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. That is verse 19 and verse 20 it says, immediately they put their nets and followed him. Look at Luke chapter 5. Very interesting. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 onwards. <clears throat> and it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake Gennesaret, that's another word for the Sea of Galilee, and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen got, were gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Peter's. And prayed him that he would thrust out a little while from the land. And he sat down and he taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when, he, when they did, when he had thus done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And then... Was for he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which were taken, and so he was also, and so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Next verse. Okay, that, that was that's the same verse, uh, previous verse. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not; from henceforth thou shalt catch men. See, look at verse nineteen and verse twenty. So much has happened. What has happened? They were casting their nets all the night. Okay? But they were not able to catch any fish. Then what happened? Jesus comes, teaches them a word, and he looks at Simon. Did you catch any fish, Simon? He said, no, Lord. Put it on the other side. Lord, what are you saying? But you know what has happened? Just before that, Simon Peter's mother-in-law is also sick. He's, he, she's healed. That's a sequence, a chronological sequence of events. It's beautiful the way Simon Peter is Signed up to discipleship is a unique way than the other disciples. Okay. And now what happens? Simon Peter sees that his mother-in-law is healed. And then he sees the word being preached. Then he sees a miracle. And he says, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Please depart from me. The only guy among all the disciples before the day of Pentecost confessed before the Lord that he was sinful. See, look at that. Do you see that? He said, depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. He says, don't worry. Don't fear. From now on, you will catch men. Amazing. 
There's another place in the Bible which I want us to look at. Simon Peter. Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. Oh, sorry, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 onwards. Very interesting question. The Lord is going to ask each one of us today. When Jesus came to the coast of Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some said Elijah, and some other Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Immediately Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Wow. You got all the answers, the A for the day. Okay. Quiz. And you got an A. And Jesus answered and said, Blessed art thou Simon bar Jonah, Simon son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed it to you. Lesson to be learned. Every understanding of Jesus Christ has to be done by Jesus Christ. When he says, I am the potter, you are the clay, and you know what he's saying, this is what you thought God is, but let me fashion your mind so that you know truly who God is. So when Simon Peter raises his hand and says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus says, you know what, flesh and blood, it was not your intellect. It was not your intellect. It was the Spirit of God which showed you what truly I am. It was fashioned by God himself. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Immediately Peter said, man, I have arrived. Next verse. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Simon Peter is listening to all this. Wow! What is happening? The righteous man's righteousness is increasing. Then charged he his disciples that they should not tell any man that he was Jesus the Christ. For that time, for from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. The moment Simon Peter heard this, what has happened? Self-righteousness came. Then Peter took him. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine this? Imagine, figure it out. He takes the son of God, God who created the world itself, and starts to rebuke him. (laughs) Began to rebuke him saying, be far from thee, O Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Next verse. But he turned and said unto Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed unto you, but my father who is in heaven. Just few verses. Few verses and few minutes down the line, I said, you have to go through suffering, you have to go through trial, you have to go through persecution, I have to do all this, and you will also go through that. And he said, no, 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 no. This is not what I thought about being a potter and you're the clay. And immediately started being Jesus, you know what he said? Get thee behind me, Satan. Can you believe that? One moment, he is a messenger of God. The next moment, because of self-righteousness, iniquity has set in. What does he become? A messenger of Satan. Did you ever see this? And that's precisely the reason why Jesus is watching him. Okay. Now you think that you're better than your brothers, right? Oh, you got a great revelation. You thought you were the most learned among your brethren, right? I'm waiting. And in Luke chapter 22, He messes it up big time. Why? Satan has sought permission from Jesus to sift this man as wheat. Why does it not talk about every other disciple? Why does it not talk about every other disciple? You know what? That's the difference between two men who betrayed Jesus big time. One guy outrightly. One guy was Judas. Satan entered him. 
And the other guy was Peter. Satan is what? Sifting him. All the process. Ultimately, the culmination of this is awesome. It's found in John's Gospel, chapter 21. 21. <laughs> Verse 3 onwards. He failed miserably. He wept bitterly. And he said, Simon Peter said, I'll go fishing. Enough. I signed up for discipleship. But this is not what I thought discipleship was all about. I'm going fishing. Back. Amazing. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately and that night they caught what? Nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore but the disciples knew that it was Jesus. And Jesus saith unto the children, have you any meat? They answered no. And he said unto them, cast your net. Exactly the same thing to Simon Peter. Remember, the first time Simon Peter was commissioned and was signed up to discipleship, what has happened? He was casting the net all night. He was calling all night. Caught nothing. And immediately he found some success. He said, God, I'm a sinful man. He repented of his sin, started following Jesus. Jesus gave him revelation. And then the next moment he messed up. Next moment he messed up. And finally he said, no, this is not for me. You know what is happening over here? You see the process? The process of going high in the Lord, trusting in your self-righteousness and, and failing. There is failure which is assigned to everyone. There is failure. You will go through failure. It's, and in May, it's, that is a part of God's plan to mold your character is that He will allow failure in your life. You will go through it. All the claims and the tall claims that you gave to God. God, this time is the last time I'm indulging in the sin. I've, God, I will not deny your name. This is the last time. One last chance, Jesus. I will prove to you that I will overcome. All claims will be dealt with. And finally, what is the lesson? Why am I telling you all this? The lesson is this. One of the things that we sign up, you know what, we are given, we, are, we like so much in, 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 in worldly terms, one of the guys who is our icon is a guy who's got a lot of talent and who succeeds. Everybody looks up to him, talented man and he succeeds. You know what I like in the world, this is, this is just my choice, when I see a guy working hard at it and not giving up, that is the guy I want to, I want to follow. Everybody is favorite with of Federer. Why? Oh, he's got great talent. Oh, he get, cuts the angles. He get, gets the beautiful serve. Serve and volley techniques absolutely fine. What angles? What cross court winners? He never sweats to get a grand slam. But look at Nadal. He's running here, there, everywhere and gets his grand slam. You know what the difference? There's one guy who never gives up. Who never gives up. He's a fighter. I said, man, that is what I want. And that is what I want to be in God's kingdom. I will mess up several times, but God, I will fight it. I want to come back to you. It doesn't matter. How many ever times I fail, I want to come back to you. You know what? Devil is after each one of us. The fight for our soul is this. You will fail. You'll say, enough, Lord. Enough. I'll go, I'll go back to fishing. Enough. I've tried and made all these claims to God. Enough. It's not possible. Think about it. I like people like that. Who will come back to the Lord in number of times. They will fall a million times, but they will come back to the Lord a million times and say, God, unless you give me the power to overcome this sin, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. That is the second point. The third point I want to make. But that he is the potter and I am the clay. I want us to look at Proverbs chapter 30. In the KJV please. Proverbs chapter 30. <clears throat> Verse 7 onwards. Of Proverbs chapter 30. The just man... Proverbs chapter 30, 30. 
This is really amazing. This probably I have never seen this before. Seven, two things I have required of thee. Deny me, deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and vice. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be full and deny thee. And say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal. And take the name, what? Of the Lord? In vain. The question is, how do you take the name of the Lord in vain when you what? When you steal. Okay. Exodus chapter 7. Exodus chapter 20, sorry. Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments. Verse 7. What does it say? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You know what it's actually talking about? He's saying, it's not about vocabulary. It's not about vocabulary. Oh my God, no, no, it's not about that. It's about ambassadorship. How do you, how do you represent me in this world? When Jesus, when God sees you, does he say, these people take the name of the Lord in vain? Because they are stealers, they are thieves. It's not nothing to do with vocabulary, it has got everything to do with ambassadorship. How we represent Christ, what has this got to do with the message? Let me turn, let, let us turn to one place in the Bible, in Deuteronomy, chapter 9, verse 1 to 6. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 1 to 6. Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go in to, go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself. Cities great and fenced up to heaven, and people great and tall, and children of the Anakims whom thou knowest, and of them of whom thou hast heard. Uh, uh, say, who can stand before the Anaks? Next verse. Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them and he shall bring them down from before thy face. So thou shalt drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord hath said unto thee. Speak not thou into thine heart after that which the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee saying. For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of these nations the Lord hath drive them out from before thee. Next verse. Not for thy righteousness. Or for the uprightness of your heart, does thou go to possess their land? But for the wickedness of these nations that, thy, that the Lord thy God that drive them out from before thee, and that they might perform the word which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand therefore that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for your righteousness sake, for thou art a stiff naked people. You know what he's trying to say? He's saying, you know what? Do not ever, ever trust and say that you are a good, good people and therefore God has brought you out. It is not for your righteousness sake. It is because, a lot of people, you know, say, I responded to Jesus. When God came and said, I never rebelled against him. When God came and so told me that you are a sinner, I got convicted of my, of my sin and I repented and therefore I'm righteous. And you know what is, what is happening after that? You're actually trusting in your own righteousness after that. That's what he says in Galatians. He says, having started in the spirit, why are you perfecting the flesh? And you know what? He he uses a very strange word. He uses, who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you? You know, it's a very strange word. You know what that means? How come after having started in the spirit, now you're working out your own righteousness. You know what is happening? You have become, you are bewitched. In other words, you're getting into witchcraft. It's a very strange word. Who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you? Are you bewitched? Next verse. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 10 to 16. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 10 to 16. And it shall be, when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all goods which thou fillest not, and wells digged 
which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and serve him, and shall swear by his name only. Do not forget the fear of God, which is absolutely crucial. That's very important. You know, it's one of the things that happens even as we grow in the law and when we think that we have attained to a certain level, one of the things that we might slip in is the area of fear of God. Let's move, let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 18, please. Let's move on. <clears throat> verse 10, verse 9 onwards. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build it and to plant it. That means what? They were righteous people. If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Now therefore go to, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise devise against you. Return you now everyone from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. Verse 12, and they said, there is no hope. This is the reaction of the people after they heard the words of the prophet. You know what they said? What did they say? There is no hope. What does it mean? There is no hope. You know what that means actually in today's terms? You know what? I don't believe it's possible to live a godly life. It's not possible. There's no hope. It's not possible. You know, one of the things that I see in a lot of Christians, they see certain people who are able to overcome sin in their life and they look at it. You know what they say? Because their life convicts them. Because they cannot live up to the standards that are set by that person. You know what they do? You know what? There's something wrong with that guy. There's something wrong with that guy. It's something phony about his character. It's not possible to live this life. It's not possible. There's no hope. What are you saying? That I should not steal? That I should not commit adultery? That I should not do all, do all these things? It's not possible to live this day and age the life that you demand from me. There's no hope. Very important question we need to ask. Do you believe? Do you believe that it is possible to overcome every sin that you are entangled with in your life? Do you believe? Second Kings chapter 17 verse 14. That's the key. Second Kings chapter 17 verse 14. It says, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn you from your evil ways, keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and, and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but harden their necks like to the neck of their fathers and did not believe. Oh, there is no hope. This is impossible for us to live this Christian life. It is impossible to live in this world without giving a bribe or taking a bribe. It is impossible to be transparent in financial matters. It is impossible to be without, I mean, be not, not being defiled by adultery. It is impossible to live up to the standards of Jesus. I don't believe it. And if somebody, somebody lives by it, you say, you know what? There's something phony about his character. Something phony. Something phony. There's something really wrong here. You know why? Because that life convicts you and you know what you don't, you, because Jesus challenges you and say, no, this is not possible. It is because it's not possible by me, it cannot be possible by anybody, anybody else. After all, we are all human. We are all human. How is it possible that a man can live for seven years? How is it possible that he is absolutely open about his finances? How is it possible? There should be something shady in his character. It's not possible. Why? Because it's not possible with you. You're shady. You're a hypocrite. You're a compromiser. There is no hope. It's impossible. I don't believe. And therefore I don't obey. What is the attitude of, our, of us 
When we see, that's what Paul says, you know what? If it is possible with me, it is possible with everybody else. I was a blasphemer. I was a murderer. I was a persecutor of the church. God could change my life and make me one of the greatest apostles. How much more with you? Will you believe? Do you believe? I'm not trying to boast. It's, it's something which I have tasted and I know. Even though I fall so many times in certain areas, I know for a fact that if I believe, I will be able to overcome. And it's just because I don't believe enough. I don't confess my unbelief enough. How many times have you confessed your unbelief? Oh, you never thought that was sin. You know, we come and confess about adultery, we come and confess about stealing, we confess about so many other things. But how many times unbelief? God, I did not believe. It's a serious thing in the kingdom of God. God tolerated the disobedience of the children of Israel several times, ten times. The tenth time, you know what they said? Oh, there are giants in this land. We cannot overcome. Joshua and Caleb rose up. They tore their clothes and they said, you know what? Come on guys, these people will be fodder for us. God is with us. There is no giant we cannot overcome. Please believe. Something shady about Caleb and Joshua. Stone them. Stone them to death. Think about that. What is our reaction? When a prophet comes and gives the word, he says, Jesus is the potter, you are the clay. Do you believe? You know, I look at three categories of people all the time. It's not my own thing, my own analysis, it's what the Bible says. People who hear the word are categorized into several classes. Let me look at certain classes. Luke chapter 8. <clears throat> Luke chapter 8. Verse 11 onwards. Now he's talking about the parable of the sower and the sower, right? The sower of the seed. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and take away, the, take away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe. Lest they say there is hope. Before that ever happens, the devil comes and snatches it, and they, say, they will say there is no hope. It's impossible. Next class of people. They on the rock are they which hear. Receive the word with joy. These have no root, which for a time believe. Or they will also believe. Only for a while, little while. And in a time of temptation, they will say it's impossible. It's not possible to live like this. No, 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 no. I don't believe. Then, and that, so I just want to categorize them into one club. Okay? People who have little or no belief. A little belief or no belief. Verse 14. And that which fell among thorns are they which they have heard the word go forth and are choked with the cares and with the riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. First class of people who did not believe. They had little belief or no belief. There's no, there's no point in saying that they believed that because at the time of temptation their belief was tested and they failed. There was no belief at all. Second category of people is very, very dangerous. Now who are these categories of people? These are the people who come to church. Who hear the word with all gladness. There is one such man. When Jeremiah comes and prophesies this prophecy to the children of Israel, there is one such man who receives the word. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 30. Let me show you. 38. Jeremiah chapter 38. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 38. Yes, verse 14 onwards. Now, this is the king Zedekiah. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet. You know what happens before this? 
Jeremiah is prophesying and prophesying and prophesying. People said, there is no hope. Take Jeremiah and put him in a pit. They said, take Jeremiah and put him in a dungeon. But there is one king who has got a little... He hears the word. He hears the word. But this is what is happening to him. The Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third entry that is in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a king, hide nothing from me. Then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, if I declare it unto thee, you will surely put me to death. And if I give thee counsel, will thou not hearken unto me? So Zedekiah the king swears secretly unto Jeremiah saying, as the Lord liveth that made us this soul, I will not put thee to death. Neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. Next. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, If thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princess, then thy soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live and thine house. You know what he's trying to say? He said, Jeremiah says to Zedekiah, Zedekiah, the judgment is set. There is no turning back from God's judgment. There is only one hope for each one of you. Please obey the God, obey God's counsel and go to Babylon. Go to Babylon. Please go to Babylon. That is the only way you will live. Captivity is the process God has given to you so that your character will be molded. There is no other turning back. If you believe that captivity is a way that God has set for you to mold your character, then you will obey my voice and will go to captivity. You know, most of the people, they don't want captivity in their lives. We talked about Joseph yesterday. It's amazing. Amazing. Can you see the way God molds a person's character and how what we call character in the world is molded. molded. People with impressive resumes and this guy has no resume to show. Daniel was one guy who accepted that. And he goes to captivity. He doesn't rebel. So there are a particular class of people who receive the word. Then what happens? But if thou wilt not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then shall this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. And Zedekiah, the king said unto the Jeremiah, I am afraid of what other people will think. That is the case. And the concerns, opinions of men. You know what, if I live like this, people will call me radical. They will mock at me. Oh, if, if, if I say I will not watch this, I will not go to this movie theater, my friends will mock me. Everybody will start mocking me. Yes, concerns. But Jeremiah said, he looked at him and said, King, I beseech thee, I plead with thee. If you do not obey my voice, there is captivity and death. There is death for you. There is death for you. You know what? Every time pastor comes and preaches, anybody who's got, who's truly a prophet of God, he will come and say, you know what? Captivity is set for you. This is the only way God will mold your character. Submit. Submit to the authority of God. Submit to the will of God. Don't worry about what other people will think about you. Come open. Tell me what all you're going through. Don't hide your sin. Don't hide your iniquity. Tell me what exactly are you going through. Please, I beseech you. I beseech you. Think about it. How many times from this pulpit people have besought you that you will submit to the authority of God. You know what? We don't like this. We don't like captivity. But captivity is the only place where Daniels will be made. You want to become a Daniel? Oh, everybody wants the wisdom of Daniel. But Daniel was a captive in Babylon. Are you a captive? Do you like this? Do you like this process of molding your character? It takes a lot of, of, of guts. That's a slang word. Zedekiah, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I sp- speak unto thee, so it shall be well. Captivity is good for you. Captivity is good for you, Jeremiah. 
and they, and thy soul shall live. Then what happens to Zedekiah? But if thou refuse to go forth, this is the word of the Lord that God has showed me. And behold, all the women that are left in the king of Judah's house shall be brought forth to the king of Babylon's princess. You know what is happening? Because of one man's disobedience, because one man did not submit to the authority of God, his entire household is at stake. His kings, his princes are slaughtered before his very eyes. And his eyes are put out. Amazing. Amazing. Next verse. Then said Zedekiah unto Jeremiah. Then don't tell anybody, please, that you told me all this. You know, already decided in his heart. Second category of people. And he dies. That is what I'm talking about. The second category of people where the word of God comes. But the cares and concerns, the pleasures, other people's opinion, what has happened? It has choked you to death. That is what the end of the second category is. You might think you're okay. After all, I'm in the church. I'm going to church regularly. It doesn't matter. But one day, you know what? You will, you will be set, set up by the enemy to death. Now look at, look at, let us look at the end of the first category. Look at the first, second category first, but I look at the first category. <clears throat> Let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 18, please. Verse 12, and they said, there is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices. What is wrong? What is wrong, for pa- Pastor, if I take a drink once in a while? What is wrong, Pastor, if I watch a movie once in a while? What is wrong, Pastor? Why are you putting us these boundaries in this church? Why can't we be like any other church? And therefore, verse 15, Because my people had forgotten me, they have burnt incense to vanity, and they caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths, to walk in paths in a way not cast up, to make their land desolate and a perpetual hissing. Everyone that passeth thereby shall be astonished and whack his head. I will scatter them as an east wind before the enemy. I will show them the back and not the face in the day of their calamity. This is what Jeremiah speaks. You know what the response of the people who said there is no hope? You know what they do? Next verse. Then said they, Come, let us devise devices against this Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come, let us smite this prophet with our tongue and let us not give heed to any of his words. You know what is happening over here? Because they do not change. Because when God comes with a powerful word, they said, we cannot, we don't believe this about Christian life. This Christian life is impossible. They said, there is no hope. And when God says, there will be judgment in your life, if you do not obey, you know what they will say? Let's kill the, Let's kill the prophet. Let's smite him with what? With our? With our what? What? With our tongue. Let us smite his character. Let us slander his name. Let us call, let us call him whatever. So that his words will not have any effect in your life. You know what exactly happens when you slander a man's character from the pulpit, who is preaching from the pulpit? When his character is slandered and when he starts preaching to you, you are already judging him and those walls have, those judgments have become walls and nothing of his words are coming and hitting your head or your heart. You will not be able to listen to a prophet anymore. Why? Because you have smitten him with your tongue. You have smitten him with your tongue. Turn with me to James chapter 4. Go back to NKJV. 
James chapter 4, NKJV. <clears throat> Hebrews, James chapter 4. Verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure? The war in your members? You lust and you do not have. He's telling to believers. What is he saying? You murder. You know what? This is just not character assassination. That is what we call as gossip. You know why they do character assassination? Just because they are afraid of the law to kill him or me or any any preacher. If the law would have permitted, let us murder this father, they would have murdered. They are afraid of the law. They are already lawless in their hearts. They will murder. It's a natural consequence of events. It's cause and effect. The sequence of events is this. The word of the Lord comes. You see, you take it and you believe it. That's the reason why in the last time, God was telling me so strongly. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles 20. 20. 2020, 2 Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 20. 2 Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 20. So they rose early in the morning and went into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and your inhabitants of Jerusalem. What? Believe. In the Lord, your God, and you will be established. Believe in the prophets and you will prosper. Believe. That's the fundamental thing. Otherwise, you know what's going to happen? You will be like the Pharisees. Did you ever think? Jesus comes and tells the Pharisees, you brood of vipers. Before Jesus came, they all thought they were good people. Okay, let's imagine. Uh, a Pharisee named X was 30 years old. Now he graduated from the highest class before Jesus came. Now Jesus, this is just, this is still Jesus was not into the scene. Both were born. Jesus was born in Nazareth, or oh, sorry, in Bethlehem, in a manger. 30 years of his life he was obscure. And there's another guy who was born into a Levite family or a rabbi's family, and he went into a rabbinical school. Okay. Both grew. 30 years old, Jesus gets into ministry. 30 years old, he is one of the established rabbis in the rabbinical priesthood. Just think about this. Rabbi X. By the time he arrived 30 years, he graduated top of his class. You know what they said? The most righteous man. Man, you have arrived. Oh Lord, I fast. I tithe. I am not like this tax collector. Did he ever think at the 30th year before Jesus comes to the scene, the three and a half years down the line, he would be responsible for murder. Just think about it. A rabbi X, responsible for Jesus' murder. Think about it. Think about it. Why? Jesus came and said, you know what? All your righteousnesses will be right first. You need to be born again second. Unless you are born of water and the word and the spirit, that is water and the spirit, you will not enter or see the kingdom of God. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of these Pharisees. No, they, they were absolutely envious about Jesus' doctrine. They were envious. You know why? Because they could not, first of all, take this guy who was from the tribe of Judah, not even a rabbi, carpenter's son. How come his doctrine has got so much power? Which Bible school did he graduate from? I taught my class in the rabbinical priesthood. What are you talking about? Amazing! Amazing! One of the most favorite verses in the Bible is Matthew chapter 22. This is one of my favorite books, favorite chapters. I'll show you this verse. Amazing! Amazing! The sequence of events that happens before something incredible happens. What is talking about? He's talking about the kingdom 
being taken away from the Jews and being given to the Gentiles. That's what essence in a sense though. Not completely, but roughly the essence of the first 13 verses of Matthew chapter 22. Now when they heard this, Jesus said, you know what, you Pharisees, because you rejected me, I will go to the Gentiles. When the Pharisees heard this, verse 15, then went Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. You know what they are actually doing? They are plotting. Plotting, plotting, they are looking, let us smite this fellow's character. Smite. And they sent to him the disciples, their disciples and the Herodians. You, should, you know what Jesus said? Be very careful of the doctrine of the Pharisees and also the doctrine of the Herodians. The doctrine of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. The doctrine of Herodians is compromise. No, the Pharisees come, it's okay. No, the Herodians are also joined. Teacher, we know that you are true. Flattery. And teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone. For you do not regard the person of men. Tell us therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness. And said, why do you test me? You hypocrites, show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius and he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. And he said, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. You know what it in essence means? Whose image is this? Caesar's image. So give to Caesar what Caesar's image belongs. Who's made in the image of God? You and I. So give to God ourselves. That's what he means in a, in a sense. Next. When they heard these words, they marveled and left him. Next comes the Sadducees. Now these guys are asking about the resurrection of the dead. You know what is the second class of people? They do not want accountability. They want Jesus to tell them that there is not going to be any resurrection. So that on the day of judgment, they don't have to stand before a God, before a holy God and give an account. Jesus answers them, no problem. The last, after these people come, you look at this verse, Matthew chapter 22, amazing, amazing verse. Verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that they had put Sadducees to silence, they gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is a great commandment in the law, thou shalt all this stuff. Verse 41. All this. This is incredible, right? This is, a, this is a climax. While the Pharisees were gathered together, saying, Jesus, what think ye of the Christ? Whose son is he? They said unto him, the son of David. Now Jesus is answering. He's asking him the question, who is the Messiah? Who do you think he is? And they said, he should be the son of David. Next question. Then the Lord, then can he said to them, how then does the David, does David in the spirit call him Lord? You know, he's silencing them with answering a question. You ask all these questions, right? I want to ask you one question. What is the question? How then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? Now he's asking, 30 years of Rabbi Nicholas, you follow. Rabbi X, you top the class, right? Did you not this, get, get this question? This simple question, if David called his son Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day anyone dare ask him any question. Full stop. You know, you know what he's actually talking about? You have grown so much in your intellectual knowledge and your rabbinical priesthood, but one thing I want to ask you, when I ask you anything concerning the spirit, you will not be able to ask me. Will you, will you, you will not be able to answer me. Why is David able to say that in the spirit, did you see that word? In the spirit. Anything concerning the spirit, you will not be able to answer. You will not be able to. That is how shallow your rabbinical priesthood is. David. That's exactly what is happening. And what they will say? Smite him. Put him to death. Put him to death. Cause and effect. Just imagine, Rabbi X graduated from top of the class, from the rabbinical priesthood. Jesus' blood is on his hands. Did you ever think? Did he ever think that he would be responsible to put Jesus to the cross when he graduated? 
That's what happens. When you do not deal with situations concerning your sin. And when a tough word comes, you know what will happen to you? When you say there is no hope, you will kill. It's just a matter of time. You will murder. You will murder. Smite him with his tongue, with our tongue, so his words will not have any effect over our lives. Smite him. Question that we need to ask ourselves. If Jesus is the potter and we are the clay, when he comes and tells us tough things, tough things, how do we react? You know, our obedience is not tested in the simple, simple things. When he, when come, when he comes, oh, you're a great guy. Come, you'll do all this very good. And that is not the way. When, comes, when he comes and says, this is what is shelly about your character. Change. Change. I want to mentor you. Submit. And you know what he'll say? Does, he, does God speak only through this man? I will have my own Bible study. I will learn. I will be in my house. You know what Jesus said, God said in Jeremiah, He said, I will give you shepherds after my own heart. Who will teach you? You know something? Submitting under authority is not an option. You cannot circumvent it. You will not understand anything of spiritual consequence or of eternal value unless you come under somebody's authority and somebody's mentorship. You cannot circumvent it. It is there. It is absolutely essential. For spiritual growth. Yeah, I don't want to, I, I will sit in my home and study. Doesn't matter. It will not happen. But if you come and submit to authority, you know what is going to happen? Your mind will be open to spiritual truths that you would never even thought about. I am telling you, honestly. Four years down the line, I, the way I understand the word now, is totally different. You remember? You know, the, in, in, in mathematics, if you know, you have a theorem and a proof. Okay? Then there will be a small corollary. Right? Corollary, he writes a statement. The proof is left as an exercise. It's how it is. Every time I read Sin, Nikoni and Translation, that's a theorem. When I go and study the scriptures and I see the way that God connects that theorem to this result, it's amazing. It's a corollary which is, satis- which is solved. Understanding of the word of God is incredible. Because not, not because I'm any better than anybody else. Because one thing I have said, God, I will be at every Bible study, every fasting prayer, no matter how many times the church meets, I will be there. I'm serious about that. I'm telling you, the number of Bible studies I missed, I can count them on my fingers. Whatever the church had. I can count them on the fingers of my right hand. I'm not boasting. On the fingers of my right hand. The number of Bible studies I missed. Everything the church ordained and said, you have to be there, I was there. And it costed me a lot. I know it. I can count them on the fingers of my right hand. I'm not saying I'm not trying to boast. I'm what I'm trying to say is I was serious. And when that happens, and when I come under authority, when I don't circumvent all these things, when I open the scriptures, God opens me up to some incredible truths that even Pastor Dennis doesn't know, probably. He never even thought that synonymous transgression would lead to so much of study. And you wouldn't believe. We were in Seema's house for almost a month. Every page took us about one and a half hour to study it, the transcript. It was a thesis in itself. Just God was opening scripture like that. And that is what it is. That is what I'm talking about. Choosing the fear of God. Choosing mentorship. I, it amazes me. You know what? This is what I don't understand. You have a guy who's successful in the world. Just imagine. He's successful. He made it in life. And you also want to be successful just as he is. Let's say. What do you do? Study his books. Right? Simple. You get mentored by him. He has got a formula for success. I want to know what the formula is. This is exactly the the way people make wealth in this world. If you have read Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Napoleon Hill, 
or Dale Carnegie, I don't know. I, I used to read it long time back. I marked every. It's incredible. You know, he talks about success principles and he says, you know, I made, I interviewed all the successful people in the world and this is the pattern of their lifestyle. If you follow this lifestyle, it is guaranteed you will success. You will succeed. Everybody runs after that. And I, it amazes me if you want to succeed in the spiritual realm and you want to get mentored, we are not as serious. We take anything from anybody. It amazes me. Something which is of eternal consequence. Think about it. He said, Come on. What did he say? Does it tarry with the word? Does it tarry? Do you wrestle? It exposes your shallowness. And that's exactly the reason why you smite the prophet. It exposes how shallow your understanding is of the word of God. Every time I get a revelation, I say, God, I didn't even see this. What am I? Where am I? I want to learn more of you. You know, that is the attitude. I'm not trying to say that I've arrived. I'm not trying to say that at all. But I know for sure, if I believe, I will overcome. It doesn't matter how many times I fall, if I believe, continuously plead with God, one fine day there will be a time that I will pick up my water and pick up my mat and walk. Because that is what God says. You know what He's actually saying? I put you under someone, that is how I'm molding your character. I'm using your submission to authority to mold your character. Will you come under the submission of the authority? It doesn't matter how old or how young that man is. But I know that he succeeded. I know that his life's fine. I know he overcame. And therefore I follow him just as he follows the Lord. And people think that it is pride. Oh, don't follow me. Don't follow me. You know what? If you're not, if we, you and I don't come to that situation, like Paul, when he said, follow me as I follow Christ, then our entire exercise is in vain. It is not false humility. Whom should we follow? Otherwise, should we follow Britney Spears, Rafael Nadal, Roger Federer? Whom should we follow? Who are our, who are our icons? Who are our idols? If you and I are not an example for our children, our young generation, whom they should follow? Whom they should follow? If there is not a young man who is trying to overcome sin, other young people will see, whom should, whom should they follow? They, we don't have anybody in our peer group to follow. Everybody, whether you like it or not, is being followed just as you follow Christ. What is the whole point other one? You should go to the world and search for icons and idols. If they don't find them in the church, they will find them in the world. Think about it. Just, I know every whenever I come, I say, why do you give me heavy messages, God? I said, you know, because you need it. You fellow, you need it. The one thing which convicted me was, Wednesday's message. Saul was anointed. After he was anointed, he was hiding. Why was he hiding? Because he was shirking from his responsibility. God said, do you want to be like Saul? Immediately. Do you want to, do you want to shirk from your responsibility? Think about it. God said, I am the potter. You are the clay. You never had this was what was in his mind. Right? Right? Think about it. This is what was got in God's mind. That I will mold your character. If I have to mold your character, I have to take you through all this. There's no easy way. There's no get rich quick schemes in my kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We worship you. Pray, Lord, that this will this word will have an eternal effect in our lives. And it will mold my character and our character. Thank you, Father. I praise you. I commit each one of us into your hands. In Jesus' name. Amen.